نحمده و نسلی علی رسوله الكریم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری وحل لقدتا من لسانی یفقه قولی و جعلی وزیرا من اہلی رب یسر ولا تؤثر و تمم بالخیر و بکا نستعین یا فتاح رب زدنی علما رب حبلی حکم و الحکنی بالصالحین ربنا آتنا فی الدنیا حسنتا و فی الاخرت حسنتا و قنا عذاب النار یا اول الاولین یا آخر الاخرین یا ذل قوت المتین یا رحم المساکین یا ارحم الرحمین حسبن اللہ و نعم الوکیل اللہم انہا نجعلک فی نہورہم و نعوذ بکا من شرورہم اللہم منزل الكتاب سریع الحساب احسم الاحساب اللہم احزمہم و زلزلہم آمین یا ارحم الرحمین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ once again Alhamdulillah by the grace and tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Today we are going to talk about ayah numbers 172, 173 and 174 from Surah Ali Imran and we will go over the recitation and the word by word meaning first So I'll do billahi minash shaitan al-rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim الذين استجابوا لله والرسول من بعد ما أصابهم القرح للذين أحسنوا منهم واتقوا أجر عظيم. So in this ayah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala saying, الذين الذين means those who استجابوا. Is tajabu from jawab, like to respond to somebody, right? So like uh, a sawal is a question, a jawab is a response, right? So those who responded lillahi to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala war rasuli and to the messenger mim ba'di from after ma what asabahum, asabahum what befell them, what musibah, what, what thing came upon them, what um, what hit them basically, what, what befell upon them. And musibah comes from the same root, right? So, saad, ba, and ha. So, asaba, whom befell them, and what befell them? al the injury, like the wounds that they had got in the battlefield. lil for those who ahsanu, did good, ihsan is something good. Like we, we know from a hadith of the Prophet there are three levels of uh, our faith, like Islam, then Iman is a bit higher level, and Ihsan is the best level. So Ihsan is the most beautiful, the best, right? So Husn is something that is good, something beautiful, and Ihsan the most beautiful, right? So the the most way of beautiful way of doing something. So those who Ahsan uh, did good, did beautiful, men whom from among them what taqaw and they feared Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. They had the taqwa of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. For them, Ajrun Azim is a reward. Ajr a reward. Azim is great, right? So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that those who responded to the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger, even after they had received the wound, for those of them who did good deeds and feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is a great reward. And then the next ayah, ayah number 173. الذين قال لهم الناس إن الناس قد جمعوا لكم فخشوهم فزادهم إيمانا فزادهم إيمانا وقالوا حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل الذين دوزه قال they said لهم to them, so said to them, right? So it is a passive lahum. Uh, it was said to them, and who said to them? Anas. People said to them. So those who people said to them, in nasa, indeed the people certainly no doubt that the people could have certainly. So there's a lot of emphasis here. It's indeed, definitely, certainly, and then again, certainly, right? The uh, no doubt that people they have certainly jamau. They have. Uh, gathered jama to gather something so jama'u they have gathered lakum against you so they have so people have gathered against you so it was said to them people said to them that people have gathered you know the people have gathered against you 
فخشوهم so fear them have خشیه of them have fear of them خشیه is a kind of this خوف is a fear as well but خشیه خشیه is a kind of fear that you have of somebody when you think of them as somebody big when you when you regard them as something uh, really big and you know powerful and mighty and then you have a fear of them that's that's a special kind of fear it's called a khashiya right then what happened when people said to them this then fazadahum imanan then it instead of like making them scared or something it actually increased them in faith uh, increased them in iman waqalu and they said Hasbunallahu, sufficient for me is Allah subhanahu Sufficient for us is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa ni'mal wakil. And he's the best wakil, the best, uh, the best in whom to put trust, the best disposer of affairs, the best who takes care of all matters. Right? So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that those people, that is those people, meaning who do did good and taqwa had taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who had a huge reward. Who are these people? These are the those people to whom it was said. People have gathered against you, so fear them. But instead of increasing them in fear, it increased them in faith. And they said, Allah is sufficient for us, the best one in whom to trust. And then ayah number 174, A'udhu Billahi Shaitan Rajeem. So in the Sahih Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Fan qalabu. So they return. Qalab. Qalb is also the word used for heart. And why do we use the word for heart? Because the heart keeps turning. The heart is always in a motion. It keeps turning. Right? We say that one of the dua of uh, the Prophet sallallahu taught us is, Ya muqallib al qulub. Thabbit qalbi ala dini. Oh, the one who turns the hearts, muqallib, the one who turns the qalb, the hearts, keep my heart steadfast on your deen. It, so the heart turns, the ya Allah, it's, it can hold my heart so that it doesn't turn and everything. So the, the word, uh, the literal meaning of the word is turning. Fan qalabu, so they returned, they turned. Bi ni'amatin, they returned back, meaning they went. And then they returned back, bi ni'amatin, with the favor, with the name of, with the blessing. Min Allah. Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were fadlin and bounty. Fadl is a kind of favor, like uh, the fadl is which is something that is more than what is deserved, right? So, for example, we went to a restaurant, we ordered food and everything, and then there was a tip that was given. So, the tip is a thing. Or then somebody worked uh, at a job or something and they, they had a set salary and they got all your their salary and everything. But end of the year, the company decided, okay, the employees have been really, really good. This whole team has been really good or they have done really well. So, they'll get a bonus, right? So, the bonus that is given, that is the further. That is something which is extra. That is something that is um, beyond, like they got what they deserve and then some more. So that is for them, right? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many duas that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Ya Allah grant us your father, right? So when we, for example, when we enter the masjid, we, we say, Allahumma ftahli abawaba rahmatika wa fadlika. Ya Allah, open for me the doors of your rahma and your father, right? So, um, so here um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, so they returned with the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and bounty. Lam yas, lam yamsas hum. Did not touch them. Masa is touching. Like, like for example, when we're doing wudu, we do the masa of the head, right? Like we wash our hands, we wash our feet, uh, but we do the masa of the head. And the uh, so masa is touching, right? And even the name of Isa, the Jesus uh, Christ, the name is Masiha, right? Uh, he he would he would touch the people. And uh, the miracle that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala granted him by the permission of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala was that Allah Taala would um, uh, make it that when Isa alayhi salam, when Isa Masih would touch um, somebody, uh, somebody who was sick or something, they would get cured, right? So, yam sas hum, did not touch them, su on any kind of harm. So, no kind of harm touched them. Wat tabau, wat tabau, and they followed, and they followed ridwan Allah. They followed the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Zu is the possessor of Fadlin Azim, the bounty which is great, a great, a huge bounty. So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that say though, so they returned with the bounty from Allah and grace, with no evil having touched them. 
and they submit it to the pleasure. They follow the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the Lord of great bounty. Okay, so um, we will um, talk a little bit more about these ayat now. So what is happening in these ayat, right? So again, we um, we are continuing from the uh, about the battle of Uhud. So the, the context of the ayat. And so we understand in what context these ayat was revealed. And uh, so it helps us to understand better, right? And um, we know that this is towards the end of the passage about uh, the Battle of Uhud, which we are learning. It is the longest passage about any single battle that we uh, read all together at one place and everything. So in this battle, we know all the like after all the battle had happened and the, um, you know, like um, it, it seemed like the, um, the Muslims were winning at first, but then the tides turned after the people left the mountain and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called them out as well in few ayahs, but he told us that he forgave them and he told them that he forgave them and um, the le some lessons were learned and everything. Then what happened? This ha this battle, the Battle of Uhud had happened on the 15th of Shawwal. The month was Shawwal and it was the 15th day of Shawwal. Right? And then after all these chaos that had happened and Abu Sufyan basically who was the leader of the other army, uh, the Quraysh, who came and who, who, who said some things like, you know what like some some like you know like when somebody uh, feels like they have won they make some nasty commands to put somebody down and everything they're like okay this is for Badr you know like you got some at Badr and we got this one and this is for that and is um, who of you are alive and there's a whole passage about what is the conversation that happened between them but basically this conversation happened and after that he left he and his troops left right and then they were going towards Makkah they were going back towards Makkah and when they were around 30 miles away from Medina, right, at a place called Rahwa, right, they this it just occurred to them, you know what? What did we do here? What did we do in this battle? Our mission was to kill the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And their mission was to take over the place, place of Medina, basically commit a um, a, a sort of a, um, a genocide there and take over all of their property, all of their everything and just finish Muslims once and for all and everything. Their purpose was to just take over everything and, and to kill him and to like just finish this mission of Islam once and for all so it wouldn't trouble them again and everything. And that was their mission, Audhubillah, right? But they, yes, they had killed some people and yes, they had been very vulgar in what was done to the bodies um, of the people after they were killed. But when they were coming, uh, but when they were coming back, basically they didn't they didn't gain any military uh, wealth. They didn't gain any of part of their other mission, nothing. And they were, when they were coming back, um, they were like, OK, what did we just do? Right. They were the Muslims were weak right now. Why did we just leave and come back? We, they didn't even like they, they the thought just came to them then when they were 30 miles away from Medina now that we should have struck a wave three and finished the job right because what happened they in the battle there were two kind of waves like the first wave the the Muslims were clearly winning and everything and they were um, basically these people were um, have, although Muslims had no preparation for the war these people had been preparing for one whole year they had been preparing collecting all the arms and ammunition and preparing their army and everything they had been doing all this for whole one year Muslims had just like come to the battlefield literally they got to know about it the day before and they just came like they had nothing um, to prepare to basically defend themselves not much to defend themselves and everything yet the first wave they were winning Right. The second wave, they actually took them by surprise because the archers had left and now they were winning. So they were like, we should have just uh, engaged in a third wave and just finished everything. What did we do? So Abu Sufyan then thought, OK, you know what? We will go back and we will let's all collect our, our people together and let's go back and let's finish the job. Let's let's go and, um, you know, uh, get this done and everything right. On the other hand, the the same thought came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while he was the other side, like in it towards Medina. And the same thought come that, you know what, they might come back, right? So, and, and that gives us like a, such a beautiful thing that a believer, right? Um, a believer has, uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala blesses them with this thing that before things are going to happen, sometimes um, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala helps them understand the, the how the things are playing out. Right? Sometimes they, are, they, are, they understand that, you know, something's fishy out here. Something's, something or something gives us a, a bad feeling. You know what, something, something's going on here or something's not right. Something doesn't feel right or something. And so these thoughts, they, some, 
sometimes come to us, then it's like, okay, we just uh, we just want to protect ourselves. We want to do more and everything, right? And in this situation, when they were physically hurt, they were mentally hurt, they were emotionally hurt. There had been so many deaths in the whole of Medina, right? They were physically very, very uh, much hurt. They were mentally because some a mistake had happened, a battle they was about to uh, uh, win. They had just lost those battles. They, they were spiritually down because like Ayat had come down um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is um, telling them that they had done their mistakes. So um, it, it's this. They were spiritually very down. And at that point, when they were hurt at many different levels, the Prophet says, let's get together and get to face Makkah once again. Let's get together and get to face Makkah once again. Right. And um, and the Sahabas, they got up despite whatever they were fixing. And what day was it? The 16th of Shawwal, the very next day. The Prophet has himself hurt physically. He had fainted. He has his like um, his blessed teeth have broken, right? Like some of his teeth have broken. There is the visible marks of injury on on all of his face. Like it took a long time to stop the bleeding, literally, right? And so many of the Sahabas have been have been uh, murdered. So many have been injured. Some are even finding it hard to get up. Right. Uh, they, they just to get up is hard for them, let alone walk and go far and fight again. Like all that is very, very hard. Right. But despite all of that, they got up. Right. So uh, just if we pause a little bit here, sometimes what happens to us is when we are hurt about something, maybe physically, maybe emotionally and everything, what happens to us generally? Right? And why were these people so special? What happens to us generally is like, um, the things that we are doing for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they start to suffer. Like our our worship goes less. Our things. Oh, I'm I'm not feeling that well today. Oh, I'm I'm like uh, really upset about something that uh, so and so did. Like uh, maybe my sister did something, my husband did something, my friend did something, my work colleague did something, or said something, or everything which is hurting me. me like I'm I'm just sad about it, or I'm angry about it, or I'm this about that about it. And then what happens to us is, and this is the reminder to myself first uh, before. For anybody else is what happens to us is our quality of work and our in uh, quality and quantity of worship or a good deed that we're doing for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala maybe some charity maybe some uh, some goodie that suffers we we go back a little bit in that we lack a bit in that we um it's not as strong as we we just uh, okay when I feel better then I'll do it more you know like or something like that but these sahabas even in the face of this extreme pain and everything of all sorts like there were like different kinds of things that had touched them different kind of injuries that had fallen on them different kind of hurts that they had yet they got up and they listened to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam right so what, what and again what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying here the, the way Allah ta'ala has worded this ayah is so beautiful he said he says like first he says Allah, then he says, he didn't say that those who responded when the prophet asked them get up, they got up. No, Allah SWT is saying those who responded to Allah, right? Because what happens is the people understood, the sahabas understood, and may Allah help us to understand that as well, that the word of the prophet, a prophet does not save of his own accord. A prophet of Allah says what Allah Taala asks him to say, right? So the the command, the following the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of the messenger was responding to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Because if it was just the prophet, just a person, right? Then what had happened, then, then the people could turn back and say, Ya Rasulullah, you are hurt yourself as well. Look at the condition. Like, you know, how can we go? Look at us. We are finding it hard to just sit up, stand up. We are so much hurt, right? Somebody's limbs have been mutilated. Somebody's, something has happened. Some They're ble still bleeding. They're having it hard and to go and fight in the battlefield in this situation. But what they understood what this is not just coming from the Prophet. This is coming from Allah, right? So they understood this thing and that's why they were able to get up, right? And they responded to Allah and the messenger. So for us also, it means that when the messenger tells us something, it is the word of it, it is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to do. What is the difference between the Quran and the Hadith? The Quran is literally the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it to Jibreel alayhi salam and Jibreel alayhi salam delivered it to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam told it to us verbatim as it is. This is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said exactly these words. When we are reading the Quran, these are the words of our creator as it is. No change. Right? And what is a hadith? A hadith is the sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the things that he said, but it is the message is from Allah. The message is still from Allah, but the words are his own. 
right? He ha he's saying it, he's not saying it verbatim. He's like saying using his own words to describe. So, for example, let's say somebody gives me um, a message says, okay, uh, tell her that you know, like um, I'll I'll wait for her here, and then I just say, you know. Uh, she told me to tell you that, uh, you know, at this time when you go there, then she will be there uh, so you can meet her. Now, I told the same message, but the wordings were a bit different, different, right? The wordings were a bit different because it was my own way of talking, my own style. Everybody has a style of talking, so it was my own style of talking, right? My own kind of words, but the message was there. So listening to the Prophet or listening, obeying the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, following the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is also responding to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet has a level. At the same time, the Sahabas understood another thing, which uh, which also uh, it is great if we all understand that as well, is as great as the Prophet is, as high the rank of the Prophet is, and as much as we respond to and follow the Prophet, we worship only Allah, right? The worship is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? We don't worship anybody, any creation of Allah, no matter how high any creation is. We worship only the Creator. But we follow the messenger because the what does the creator want from us? How will we come to know that? We'll come in to know about it through the prophet, right? So these people got up as well, right? And so just one day after, and we know that around 70 of the Sahabas, they got up. In one narration, it says that 70 of these, uh, the Sahabas um, got up and everything. So, um, and um, and this army, this, this people who were put together to get up and go again, in this army, only those were allowed to participate who had already participated in the Battle of Uhud. Because we know that what had happened during in the middle beginning of Uhud, that people, thousand people had set out from Medina, right? And in the uh, on the way, before the battle had started, 300 of them under the leadership of Abdullah bin Ubay, the leader of the hypocrites, they left the army. They deserted the army and came back and saying like, we are not going, nobody listens to us. We are just going from here. You know, like, okay, you guys want to go fight and die and everything, go do that. We are not going to do that, right? So those were the, but those people who had left, like there's no action being taken against them, nothing. It's okay. Um, but they are not involved in the army again because army has to be kept clear of the hypocrites now, right? So they were not allowed to go in in this uh, this group that was then made to go, right? And um, we know that uh, you know they um, they got up like this to to get up and go, right? So now what what happens? Like Abdu, um, Abu Sufyan is planning and thinking to come, right? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is uh, taking the army and he's going and he went around eight miles from Medina to a place called uh, Hamraul Asad, right? So Hamraul Asad, that's the place that the Muslims went until and they, they were basically waiting for um, the Quraysh to come. And, and another thing is that, you know, in sports, for example, we understand that the best strategy, the best line of defense is what? Offense. Right. So what the, the strategy of the Prophet ﷺ was that before they come to attack us, we will go and attack them. Right. So that is because um, uh, rather than waiting for them. So that, that was a strategy, a military strategy at that time. Right. So. And they were ready. They were waiting for them to now come. So they were not uh, they, they were eight miles ahead at this place called Hamraul Asad. Right. And then at this time, what happened was that um, when um, Abu Sufyan was preparing his people uh, to go, uh, he met with uh, with a group of people, right? Uh, a group of people came and uh, they were traveling basically and they met um, Abu Sufyan, right? And um, um, one also Abdul Qais, right? He was um, the the tribe of Abdul Qais. They, they came from there and uh, Naum bin, bin Mas'ud, there was one of the people. And so this group of people, when they came and they met Abu Sufyan, he said, okay, you know what? Do one thing when you're going there, because you know, like uh, just like a war, uh, just like sports, war is a lot uh, of a mind game as well. A lot of war is mind game, right? So it, it is about like uh, intimidating your uh, your opponent and, um, you know, like uh, uh, making, uh, making, uh, if, if somebody is scared already to face you, then half the battle is won, right? Whether it's sports, whether it is war. So what he said, Abu Sufyan said to this person, go and tell them, tell the Muslims when you're going there, you will meet them. Tell the Muslim that Abu Sufyan is coming with a huge army to destroy them completely, right? He's on the way and he's coming and he has a huge army prepared and like there's no way they're going to be uh, spared now and everything. So just tell them that, right? So his basic purpose was like, we'll, we'll scare them and everything, right? At the same time, uh, there was a group that was coming um, that had come from Mecca to Medina 
which was um, under um, the which was from Banu Khuza and their leader was Mabad Khuzai bin Khuzaiya, right? So he had gone from Mecca to Medina for some work and basically things like that. And he was not a Muslim, but his tribe was a friend of Muslim. Like they were, um, they were sympathetic towards Muslims. We can say they were, they were kind and compassionate, and people who saw what is right and what is wrong. They were not Muslims, but they were, um, they were people who understood that this is wrong. That and and they they kind of sympathize with the Muslims in that sense, right? Uh, so he was going back from. Um, uh, now he was going back from Medina to Mecca and he met the Prophet ﷺ at Hamra al-Asad, right? And the Prophet ﷺ told him to go and relay the news to the Quraysh that the Muslims are coming, right? And the Muslims are ready to fight and they are coming. So tell tell him this message, right? So what happened, right? So when uh, Mabad went to Abu Sufyan, he reached Abu Sufyan, he told them, you know, the Muslims are ready. You better not fight them. You know, like um, if you're planning, uh, you're planning to go and fight them. Bad idea, right? So, so, so don't go that and everything. And there's a hadith to the fact that the Prophet ﷺ told us that there's some things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with. And one of them was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put his awe in the hearts of his enemies, even at a distance of one month away. Right? That was one of the uh, blessings, one of the miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So what happened? Abu Sufyan and his army felt this, this awe and this like scare. They, they felt this fear and this awe and then they left. They was, they was like, okay, they changed their plans. You're like, okay, you know what? Uh, we've had enough and then, you know, we're we not going. Like, we, we got enough, like we don't need to go, right? Like, but what was the reason? They, they were actually scared, like, right? But they don't they didn't want to say that, right? They're like, no, 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 we, we're just going. We, we've... We've uh, we've done enough damages and everything. We're just going right like um, they can deal with this. So it's not that we are scared of meeting them, but then we just not bothered. We have things to do and stuff like that. So they just left. Right. So. And on the other hand, uh, these uh, Muslims who are tired, who have lost so much and everything, they are ready to get up. They got up and they responded despite all their injuries. And what did they do? They have they are the ones who did good among them, right? Th those who stood up. And again, this is a huge army. We're talking of a, of a lot of people. Not everybody is going to be at the same level of Iman and everything, but those who got up and everything to do, those are the people who have done good amongst them. And they have the fear of Allah in their hearts. And for them is a reward, right? So two things here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said. One is Ihsan and one is Taqwa, right? So on in their hearts, uh, they their hearts, Allah Ta'ala had chosen their hearts, first of all, for Ihsan and Taqwa, right? And the thing is, and why were they like, despite being tired and everything, how could they get up and go, right? So if we think about it, the things that we really, really love to do, we really love to do something or we really want to do something, even if we get tired in them, we, we still do them, right? For example, if we go for a vacation, let's say we go for a vacation, there's a lot of work involved in going for a vacation. We have to buy the tickets. We have to spend so much money. We have to travel. We have to do this and everything, but we love doing it. So we do it, right? If there is shopping, like if we, we are going out shopping and let's say I, I like to shop something, I like to want to shop something. I'll have to go from shops to shop. I'll have to like go out of the house, spend my gas, spend my money and spend uh, all this time looking for stuff and then choosing stuff and it's tedious, right? But and we do get tired, but we love to do it. So even when you're tired, like, OK, let's go. There's this amazing sale on. Let's go. Right. Or there's a party. Let's say one of my best friends has a party. Right. What happens is we we um, uh, we we go or, or let's say I want to host a party to for all my good friends and everything. It There is a lot of work involved in it. There's like your food has to be prepared. The house has to be cleaned. Everything has to be arranged and maybe some decorations have to be put up or something. And when people come and eat, then all these hosting has to be there. And then when people leave, there's all this cleanup to be done. There's a lot of work involved. But when we really want to do something, when we really uh, when we love to do something, then even though we are tired of it, we we still do it. We like rush to do it, right? So a person who has, who who gets, develops in their heart this shock, this love, this um, desire, this longing to please Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, then they don't get tired. And even when they get tired, they don't. They brush it, push it aside. Yeah, I'm getting tired, but this is for Allah. This is not for anybody. This is not for a person that I'm doing. I'm doing this for Allah. Right. So what happens is that they rush to do it. And what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us in the ayah just before this? 
just in the previous ayah 171, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, Allah does not waste the reward of the good doers, right? So people who are doing things for the pleasure of Allah, they realize that, yes, I am like very weak right now. And if I go to the battle, maybe I might get killed. The chances are more that I might get killed. Realistically speaking, the chances are more that I get killed than I'm able to accomplish anything in the war or to get anything out. But... I'm not doing it for the worldly victory alone. I'm doing it for what? I'm doing it for the pleasure of Allah. This is the command of Allah from the mouth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I better do it because there's a great reward. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala does not waste the reward. And this this is going to be a reward. Like and I, I even despite being tired, they were able to get up and go. Right. And what did, what does what is the quality of a believer then? Yes, a believer. Any every single human being and me and you are no exceptions of that. Every single human being can and will make mistakes in their life. We all will. This will happen to everybody. None of us is perfect. Perfection belongs only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these people, these sahabas, these companions, these, these blessed companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa radiallahu anhu ajma'in. You know, what, what had happened? There were mistakes that had happened from them in the war. There were quite a few mistakes that had happened, which proved to be very costly. But these mistakes didn't stop them from doing good in the future, from going ahead and taking a stance again, right? So what what is what is the lesson for us as a believer? Sometimes mistakes happen from us, but those mistakes should not stop us from the work ahead. Mistakes can and will happen. If they have not happened uh, now, they will happen. If they have, have happened already, then it is a chance to see forgiveness from Allah Subhanahu wa and move on. Not just to um, just not just to marinate our heart and the feeling of guilt and leave it there. No, seek forgiveness from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Clean it up, brush it off, and move ahead. Right. So, so uh, they, uh, for a believer, for a true believer who's on the path to please Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, their previous mistakes don't stop them. They're like, yes, Allah, mistake happened. Ya Allah, I'm sorry. Ya Allah, astaghfirullah. Ya Allah, forgive me. Ya Allah, forgive me. And they move ahead to make a mess. They move ahead. Okay, now I'm going to do more, right? What did Musa alayhi salam do in, in the story of Musa alayhi salam when a mistake happened from he was trying to save somebody, punch somebody and that person died. He was just trying to save somebody. The person died. What did he say? Ya Allah. He sought for sought forgiveness from Allah and he said, Ya Allah, a mistake happened for me. Ya Allah, I'm sorry. Please forgive me and I will never take side of anybody doing wrong again. Right? So and, and he 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 rushed to do good from then on. Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayya min khairin faqir. Right? The duas that he made after that. Ya Allah, I need all the good that you can send me. I'm I'm a fakir. I'm I'm a I'm um uh, you know like I'm 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 a penniless uh, person in front of you. I have nothing. I'm a faqir in front of you. I need everything, right? So somebody, a believer, uh, a believer puts themselves in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they, they don't let their own mistakes or their own injuries or their own shortcomings or their own condition or their own lack of resources, lack of strength, lack of, lack of support from other people, lack of uh, money, lack of anything, stop them. They do whatever they're able to do, right? So for these people, all they were able to do was just get up and go. Right. And they, they said, OK, we'll do that. They said we will do that. Right. So, uh, you know, and and um, uh, even if we look at that, like um, even in our deen, like an, another concept in our deen is uh, sometimes a lot of sadness can make us uh, uh, paralyze us. Right. So we know a lot of like modern day depression and stuff. One of the things about depression is when somebody is hit with depression, they're not able to move. They're not able to do anything. They're not having a shower. They're not brushing their teeth. They're in their bed. They're not moving around. They're not doing things. And they are like just uh, they're not they don't have the energy to do anything. They don't even if physically they're OK, they don't feel like they, they, they feel they don't have any energy, even though like um, they don't have any illness per se, but they are so sad and everything. But in Islam, in our deen, we are not allowed even mourning for more than three days. Why is that? Right? We, uh, because yes, we say <coughs> we say inna lillahi wa inna ilahi rajiun. Yes, we are sad. Yes, we have grief when somebody passes away and everything, but life has to go on. So after three days, we can still be sad. We can still be grieving, but we have to start doing our basic tasks. We have to start going back to work or studies or whatever else we are doing. We have to we have to eat and we have to take care of our bodies. We have to sleep. We have to do whatever physically we need to do, right? So there's so much wisdom in the commands of 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 our deen, right? And for but for these people, it's not even three days. 
Like there's so many of their family members. Somebody's brother has died. They are themselves hurt. And now the Prophet is saying, let's go. And there's like, OK, I can't get up, but they're like trying and they're like, OK, right? They, they're uh, trying. So there's a narration to the thing that there was a tribe of uh, Banu Abdul Ashar. And in that one, one Sahabi said that me and my, my brother were injured heavily in Uhud. Then uh, when the call came. And uh, um, and we were basically they were worried. These two brothers, they were worried that because of the lack of a ride and of so many wounds that they had, they would not be able to walk. Right, and they didn't have any right. Basically, they didn't have any money, so they didn't have any car. Let's let's say in the modern day terms, they didn't have any 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 bike, any car, anything. Right, they didn't have any right, and they had a lot of wounds all over their body, and they would not be able to walk. So they were worried, and and then what was their worry? Will we lose this opportunity to participate and uh, be on the side of the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam? This like so they they were. They were limping and trying and they were going. Basically, you can say they were they were on their crutches and they were like um, j just just to contemporize it a little bit. They were on their crutches. They're finding it hard to stand up, but they're standing up, falling down, getting up again and then walking towards the prophet. Yeah, we will come. Right. It is so hard. They have so much injury on that that um, and yet they're coming. Right. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves these people who who take an effort despite the uh, despite the situation that they are in, making it very hard for them to do so, right? Um, and what also is there is when somebody takes a step for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah doesn't leave us. And that we learn from the stories of the prophets before us, of the sahabas and of the people, and from our own life if you look back, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not leave those people. He He holds them. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps us and he gets our work done. So these people, they mutter, mustered the courage despite their pains and the wounds. They helped each other to even walk and then they won't. So they, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them? Ajrun azim. What they were doing? They were doing the best that they could do in that situation. The, it was the best for them. The best for them was to be able to walk and go until there. Right. So Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, what happened to him was he was imprisoned. Right? He was imprisoned for a long time and for what the things that he was teaching people about Islam and things like that and the, some things that people didn't agree with and he was in prison, he was put in the prison and what he would do while he was in the prison every Friday he would do ghusl and he's in prison, he can't go out of his cell. He would he would uh, put on his clothes and everything, clean himself up, do, do his like ghusl and everything, get ready and then he would walk until the door of his cell, the door of, of his cell is there and he's like, Ya Allah, I did my bit. And then he went back. What? Why did he do that? That he wanted to go for Juma, for the Friday prayer, but he couldn't go. So he got himself ready. He he said, these are the three steps that I can take. This is my cell. This is where I'm confined to. These are the three steps I can take. So he took those three te steps and he would say, he would come to the uh, door and he would say, Ya Allah, bear witness that I did what I can. And he went. He did the best that he could do in that situation. Right. So Allah, Allah SWT tells us in Surah Baqarah, He told us, La nafsan illa wasaha. Allah does not burden any soul beyond what they can bear. Right. So whatever each one of us can do in our situation, we do that. And how does Allah? So and when we have, we do it the best that we can with the fear of Allah. That I'm doing it for Allah, the one who created us, the one who takes care of me all the time, the one who has all my blessings that I have all the senses of my body, every single cell of my body, every single relationship that I have, every single blessing, every drop of water that I drink, every morsel of food that I eat and every place that I'm able to go to, every play, every the life of each person that I love, the uh, each of the blessings that I have, right? Everything working in my life, every single thing working, the technology working, the um, the uh, whatever I have, my hands working, my things working, it's all in the hands of Allah. And when he asks me to do, he's taking care of so much for me every single day. So when he asks me to do something and I do it, I rush to do it with the fear of Allah. I don't want to displease him. I don't want him to be displeased with me. I don't want, I want to please him, right? So I, I don't want to do anything that displeases him and I want to do the best that I can. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a great reward. So for these people, there was a huge reward. And this reward, Allah is saying like some, something is me and you telling something is great. You know, like our our imaginations are so little that we look at something like, let's say we look at the, we go to the mountains and we look at like, uh, let's say some really good uh, place. We go to, let's say Switzerland or we go to um, Banff in Canada or we go to Kashmir or we go to some places that are really, really beautiful. And you're like, 
this is Jannah. This is like beautiful. This is like paradise. We don't even know what paradise is. This is just one portion of the earth. Yes, it is very beautiful, but the paradise is another level. We don't know that, right? It is big, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the paradise, you can't imagine what it is. It is beautiful, right? And and um, the beautiful, like the way you don't know beautiful, right? So when Allah says beautiful, it's another level of beautiful, right? And this reward, one, one is me and you telling like, oh, you know what? They did something really good. They got a reward for a million dollars or a million pounds or a million euros. And they're like, wow, a million euros. That's huge. But... Uh, that's not actually huge. Like if you look at the wealth that is all the wealth that is in the world, the lowest Jannah, there are many levels in paradise. The The person who will get the lowest level of paradise, the very bottom, would his his property in paradise would be 10 times that of the whole earth. The person who will have the lowest level of paradise, right? So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Azim, when he is saying Azim, how azim will that be? Like, how great would that reward be? And this is what their aspiration was. May Allah Ta'ala make us such that we have those aspirations too. Right? And there's a narration from our mother Aisha radiallahu anha that she said to her uh, nephew, Urwa bin Zubair radiallahu anhu, that, you know, both of your fathers were from among these people that responded and for whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that they did good and they feared and they had they got a great reward. And what did she mean by both of your father? She meant like his father, which was Zubair bin Awam, radiallahu anhu, and his grandfather, meaning his um, uh, his maternal grandfather, meaning Aisha radiallahu anhu, uh, father, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So both of them were from these people. So she would, and such a beautiful way of her teaching her nephew that, you know, like to teach your nephew, the one to kind of like uh, associate with the, to learn the lesson of uh, um, that uh, we should strive to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also to tell him, look, your father did that. And you know, your grandfather did that too. So, you know, you can be of those people too. So it's such a great way of motivating and everything. And also when we see that, like uh, anything that from this world also, we know anything that we put an effort in, the the blessings that come out of it are different. How do we know that they're different, right? Because see, let's say um, uh, we play a sport, right? For fun, we go and we play, uh, let's say we race with each other or something and uh, and we enjoy, we have a good time and everything and we race and we come. There was some effort, we just went, we had a race and came back. But let's say there's another person who trains for a marathon or trains for a race um, or a sprint or anything and they, they trains and they work hard for it. They put effort into it. They're eating mindfully. They're, they're doing their workouts every day. They're do doing their practice runs every day and everything. Then what happens? And then they win a medal in the Olympics or they they do they win some other uh, races or something. That's a different kind of reward. Right? The, the amount of effort that we put in is different. Similarly, let's say uh, we are watching our nephew watching or, or let's say babysitting our nephews or our friends, children's or something or nephews and nieces and or their children and everything. Yes, we love them and yes, we care for them a lot. Definitely. But what happens when there is a mother who's taking of her own child because this child, she has gone through a lot of pain to bring this child into this world. What happens then? Because when we have gone through all this hard work for something, we value that, right? Then we take, then that, um, we, there's another level of uh, love there, another level of, um, you know, like attachment there, another level, another level of care there. So these Muslims, the people of that time, the Sahabas, they had made a lot of sacrifices to come to this theme. This was not just given to them on a platter. This Islam, they, they were not born into Islam. They came to Islam, they became Muslims, and then they 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 had to give a lot of sacrifices for this religion. So they valued it a lot. And they valued it a lot. And then because they valued it a lot, they worked hard to spread it, they, they spread the information of it, to spread the knowledge of it. They valued it and everything. And so anything that we put an effort into, one thing is that's the thing that a lot of value comes out into that. That that's a principle even in this world that we see, right? So and especially when we're doing something for Allah, the value will be great because when we put a lot of effort. So this deen, you know, uh, when we take this deen, and again, one thing is um, in in our deen, getting into paradise is actually very easy. Right? Because we know from several hadith, what did the Prophet to, to, uh, tell us? That, you know, follow your five pillars of Islam. Like there was a Bedouin who came to the Prophet and he asked, we know about that hadith, that he asked, you know what, like, uh, are you the Prophet of Allah and everything? And what the message you gave, is it from Allah? And he says, yes. And he said, okay, I believe you. So what do I have? we have to do? And he told us like, okay, these five things are the pillars. 
and then you know building needs the pillars and then everything else you uh, you uh, make the rest of the building walls and roofs and then you decorate it and this and that but there are five pillars of islam the shahada you first you take the shahada ashhadu la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu i testify that allah is the only god worthy of worship and i testify that muhammad is his servant and messenger we say the shahada we become a muslim then we start praying our namaz our salah five times a day right we build up we learn how to pray there's an effort involved in that then once we learn we start praying right then there is the fasting during the month of ramadan then we fast the third pillar of the fasting right then the fourth fourth pillar is zakat that we give every year every year the lunar year every lunar year we look at how much savings we have not how, whatever we earn and spend that's okay we don't have to calculate that anything that we have saved after one whole year which is still we still have it from one whole year and we have not spent it and it is there with us as a saving any any kind of wealth that we have gold silver money uh, whatever we have we calculate its value and we take out 2.5% of that and we give it in charity to some muslim person around the world who is struggling and who has less than an who is who is uh, who basically uh, in islamic terms below the poverty line basically right so we give that to anybody it doesn't matter who and any muslim person who is below that 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 poverty line uh, right so we give them uh, that uh, money or or we can distribute among several of them one person whatever we want to do but we give that annually right so that's zakat and then the fifth pillar is the hajj that we go for a pilgrimage to mecca um if we can afford it at least once in the lifetime right so again if we can't afford it then that's okay if we have can afford it then we go into it so as long as somebody follows these five pillars and they have faith in their heart that they believe in allah they will inshallah go to jannah right um and they don't indulge, indulge in any major sins and they they don't harm people they don't cheat people they are good people generally and everything and they they live a reasonable um reasonably good life they don't cheat people they don't harm people they are not um nasty to people they are not doing zulm upon people and everything and they are um, or or any other creation of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that matter then it's good right we can all get to paradise but getting into paradise is easy but getting into higher levels of paradise that's not easy that's not easy that requires effort that requires sacrifices so um you know firdaus is not easy janna is easy to get into janna is like belief in allah follow the five pillars be a good person that's fine i i do and more than that i do whatever is convenient for me i do, don't do whatever is convenient but if i want firdaus if me and you we want higher level if we want if we don't want to travel economy we want to travel business class no not even business class we want to travel first class no we don't want to even to even go to just any resort we want to go to a seven star we want to go like but we want that in jannah we want like everything upgraded we want that really really high level then we have to strive for it then this deen we'll have to take it at the level of sacrifice right do we have to sacrifice certain things we'll have to get up in the middle of the night and pray when everybody else is sleeping and not feel like bad about it oh everybody is sleeping why do i have to to feel actually the pleasure for it i allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invited me to get up in the middle of the night and pray to him alhamdulillah he allowed me to do that alhamdulillah besides my five prayers in the morning when it is hard to get up is the best sleep of the time i'll get up and pray fajr right so all this is ajrun adim then come so what happened with these people now that abu sufyan we know as we know that abu sufyan had sent um uh, somebody to come and uh, noam bin masud to come and tell the muslims that a huge army people are coming they're going to kill all of you they're going to get rid of all of you basically the purpose was to break their morale right so those who it is said to them uh, people say to them people have gathered against you so fear them come on like you guys like oh my goodness the you guys have to be like you know what an army is coming after you you have to be like this right so they came to the purpose was to scare them the purpose was to break their morale and everything but what was the result the result was the opposite the sahabas of allah, of the or rasul of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam they were at another level of iman right instead of getting scared they got more firm and on it increased them in faith and what is what who are such people why what happens is that when when it, it is told to them that people have gathered against you meaning not just one or two people all of them have gathered against you so you should fear them but increases them in iman what kind of people are they these are the kind of people who say hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil sufficient for us is allah 
one and he's the best one who takes care of all matters, meaning they don't rely on themselves. Somebody who relies on their own self will understand that they're no matter how powerful they are, no matter what they have, there's a limit to the abilities and the resources that they have. Every person, no matter how much we, anybody has, there's a limit to it, right? The only one who's limitless, the only entity who has no limits is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we rely on him, he is the best one. He'll never leave us. When we need him and when we ask him, he'll never leave us. When we don't leave Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he never leaves us. Right? After Ayat al-Kursi, he tells us in, uh, um, uh, he said, like um, and then whoever um, denies the ta'ud and holds on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has held on to um, a tight ring. like, it, And it never breaks. It never breaks. Right. So Allah subhanahu wa and these people, when they say Hasbunallahu wa ni'mal waqi, and this is such a beautiful phrase. Hasbunallahu wa ni'mal waqi. This is a dhikr as well that we can just repeat to ourselves all the time. If we feel scared about anything. Anything if you feel scared about something, the Prophet told us that um, you know, like if um, if there is a matter um, you know, or about which a person is feeling fear, right? That uh, someone is afraid of something. And you start to say these words a lot. Hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil. Hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil. Hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil. Sufficient. Allah is sufficient for me. And he's the best uh, of the one to take care of all matters. The best disposer of affairs. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the person free of what from what they fear. So whatever they are fearing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make that person free of that. That thing, right? So whenever any of us fear something, any kind of thing, then it is a good idea to just get to this dhikr. Hasbunallahu wa ni'mal waqi. Right? So these uh, these sahabas, what happened to to them was they got even more firm, even more firm in their faith from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, right? So for example, if if somebody says to us after a whole day of like work and tiredness and uh, we are on the way back back home to do something, somebody asks, oh, can you do this? You say, no man, I'm tired today. I can't do this, right? Or if we are sick and have some hardship, you're like, no, 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 we can't do it today. Not today, right? But they got up. So they were not at the level of Iman or Islam, but the, at the level of Ihsan, right? And um, their level and their whatever they were doing, it was not just something they were saying from their mouth. They were proving it from their actions as well, right? Um, they were proving. For, uh, so and if you can imagine the people around them, they, they were, must not have been like, wow, great, you're awesome. We can we can say that in hindsight because we know what happens later on in the Sira. But when the people were there, they didn't know what's going to happen in the future. People who are around them must have called them, you are like crazy. Are you crazy? Like, why do you have to like, you could be doing so much more in this time. Why do you have to do this Islam thing all the time, right? Why do you have to do this thing all the time, right? Um, uh, why do you have to just rush after whatever this prophet tells you to do and everything? Can't you just like, you don't have to do so much, come on. You can do like a little bit less. People would have called them these things. But yet, what did they say? Hasbunallah, Allah is sufficient for us. I'm not doing it for people. I'm not doing it for other people. I, I'm not doing it to get the, uh, you know, like the praises of people or this or, or some money or this. I'm doing it for the pleasure of Allah, right? So when you understand that, when somebody understands that and they say, Hasbunallah, then it's at another level, right? So these sahabas, these the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they got up and they were able to say, and that's what increased their iman. When they were not relying on themselves, they were relying on Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, right? And um, so again, if you think of an example, for example, let's say a person knows that a currency is going to change soon. Then what do they do? They convert it quickly, right? Because this is going to change. So whatever I have right now, it's not going to work, let's say, after six months. So I have to change it now. Right? So when they are, they have this full conviction that day by day the time is going away and everything, then they will do to change it. Right. Similarly, when the person in this life, when they totally believe, completely believe in the akhirah, completely believe in the hereafter, they come, they have full yakin that they're going to meet Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. What happens is they know every day, my, day by day, my time is going away. I'm getting weaker and weaker. My capacity is decreasing. The my capacity of my body, the capacity of my mind is decreasing. Then what happens as they start to get older, as they start to get weaker, as they start to feel all these aches and pains, as the hair starts to grit gray and everything, they run with more speed towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do good deeds, to do their mission for the sake of, because they know that I'm going to reach there. The, the time is uh, a currency right now. And what is the currency for Jannah? Right? Like in this world, we use dollars and pounds and euros. The currency for Jannah 
is good deeds, is ihsan, is iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So, so when somebody has these hardships, like when these people had these hardships, they were told when they were hurt, wounded to now get up and go, right? This was a test for them, right? Uh, it could have, um, you know, like, so despite that, when they were able to go and everything, when they see these hardships and they say, you know what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to reward me for this. This is like my my reward just increased. Like, like my percentage of reward, no matter what comes out of this, my reward, which was maybe going to be like uh, one times, is just the value on this has just become 100 times. You know, the value of this has just become 10,000 times. The value of this has become times 1 million, right? So um, this, this things just multiplied now. Now this is at another level now. So any azmaish comes, any bala comes, any hardship comes, upon them they understood they they understood that um and they got firm because it increased them in faith so now is the time to prove my faith now is the time that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing me right bilal radiallahu anhu when he was in makkah uh, and the people would torture him for saying uh, that he, you believe he, he, he would say ahad ahad i believe in one god one god and they would say no say that you believe in this this idol and that idol and he said no i won't say that I won't believe that. And they would torture him physically on the desert, on the warm, hot desert sand. They would make him lie down without his shirt on. They would put a hot burning stone on his chest, a huge hot burning stone on his chest. And he say to them, we won't remove this. You're, he's burning. And they say, we won't remove this until you say you, you deny your faith in Allah. And you say that you believe in our idols. He would say, no, ahad, ahad. And later on, people asked him, after that, people would ask him once he would like the day was over and then he would like um, uh, be done and everything. They would be done. They would get tired of torturing him and everything. And other people would ask him, why are you doing this? Why don't you just say what they want and they'll get done with it? Like it's just a few words. Just say that. Why don't you do this? And what did Bilal Radila used to say? He used to say, you know, when you go out to buy something, when you go out to buy a pot made of like mud or sand or something, you, you go out to buy a pot. Before you bring it home, what you do? You knock at it other places, at various places and see if it is good enough. See, it's not broken from anywhere or something and it's strong or not. Then you bring it home, right? You, 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 you tap on it at different places, see how the sound is, see it's not breaking, it's not very fragile. Then you're like, okay, this is good to hold the liquid, to hold the food and I'll bring it home, right? He says that when I have accepted Islam, when I have become a Muslim, when I have said that Allah is my only Lord, will my Lord not test me before he's pleased with me? Will my Lord not test me what I'm made of? That I'm going to... Uh, am I do I do I mean it or do I not mean it right so Allah subhanahu they they got firm on this right so the the higher the um you know the the higher the uh, the test we know the the more the iman jumps up the more the iman goes up right um common people work well in the common circumstances right a mu'min somebody who has iman who has haiman they when a mushkil comes when, the, when a musibah comes when a hardship comes they work even more right uh, they work even more so for example <coughs> example when somebody let's say is doing climbing a mountain mountain ring or something right um they 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 live at let's say the uh, in a valley or something or they live in the in a city they use they're used to pollution and the air there and everything now when they're climbing up the mountain that's the hard part the risk of the fall is um, there it's very dangerous and everything and climbing up you get very breathless as well and everything um, it, it's you get a lot of shortness of breath and everything but when somebody reaches the top what happens the oxygen is actually much more and it there's it's pollution free Right. And then you feel, you feel better once you reach there. Right. So it's like uh, when a lot of hardships come and we keep striving, keep moving, keep moving, then at one time it becomes easy. Right. So it's not uh, when we face the hardships, we keep facing the hardships, then it becomes easy. Right. And this phrase, Hasbunallahu wa Maluki, it is so beautiful, so beautiful that this was also the phrase that was said by Ibrahim alayhi salam when he was being, or Ibrahim, when he was being thrown into the fire. And what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do for him, the miracle? He cooled, cooled up the fire for him. He was in the middle of the fire, which everybody thought would burn him. Yet in the middle of the fire, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cooled the fire for him. Similarly, if we are in a situation, me and you are in a situation, which is hard to bear for whatever reasons, right? Then inshallah, Allah ta'ala will also cool the fire for us. People won't understand what's giving us the calmness of the heart, but Allah ta'ala will put that calmness in our heart when we say, and we believe in with full conviction, Hasbunallahu wa The same incidents, 
said by our mother Aisha radiallahu anha um, in the incident of if when like um, people spread rumors about her and everything, um, uh, but she was innocent and everything, and she said, Allah, I, I trust Allah, and Allah Ta'ala proved her innocence, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala controls everything, right? And when he is in control of everything, and when he is on my side, then what do I have to worry, right? So what happened then, right? Now these people, the uh, they had gone to Hamra al-Assad. They didn't know that Abu Sufyan is going to turn back, right? They went and they went and they went to Hamra al-Assad. They were there and everything. They were waiting there and, and, and everything, right? So, um, and, and then, Although they were ready to fight, they they were thinking they might as well, they might get killed or whatever. But they kept saying Hasbunallah and they went there, right? And what happened then? They didn't um, they didn't end up fighting and everything. There was no fight there. Nobody came to fight and everything. But on the way there, on, on the way back from there, they met a trade caravan and they did a lot of trade. So they basically made a lot of money um, on that, right? And also. It's like um, all the thing that we, they were feeling, you know, like when when you are broken, you're down, and everything, all the negativity, all the uh, the 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 loss of face in in there, that was all gone because now they have this renewed energy. Okay, we are there to fight, and nobody else came, and the the other party could not have this. Uh, uh, there was not a conclusive victory for anything, but but then because of them going there. And staying there, waiting for them, and the other party not turning, uh, not coming up. Now they had an upper hand in the uh, in the mental uh, thing that was going on, right? They they were the more powerful one mentally, right? So um, you know, like uh, so, what happened was then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is telling us that they returned with um, what happened now. Then when they went, they put all this effort and they went and they returned with. Nama from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Fadal and harm didn't touch them and they followed the pleasure of Allah. Now there are four things that they, they got, right? One is they got the blessing from Allah subhanahu wa What was the blessing? One was um, that they, they were uh, they were alive, they were well, they were not touched with any harm, there was no fighting that happened and rather they get, got all this trade and all the money. So they got this, um, uh, they got this blessing of safety and um, they came back, right? The further of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was that they got all these good deeds. They got this effort of going and this reward is a huge reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. It's a huge reward. So they got more than was ex expected even. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's treasure of further are huge. There's no, uh, he is Ghani. He, he's the most rich, right? And he has his rewards. His, uh, his treasures are limitless. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in a, through a hadith that if all the all mankind, every single human being from the beginning of times to the end of times and all the jinn kind from the beginning of times to the end of time, including me and you, all of us were to ask, we were to get together and ask all that we can think of, all that we want, all that we want, we could we, we think of and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want this, yeah, I want this also, yeah, I want this also, yeah, I want this also, I want uh, this for myself, I want this for my children, I want this for my parents, I want this much money, I want this kind of a house, I want this kind of a car, not just one house, I want this 10 houses, I want like a vacation home, I want this, anything I can think of, I want like my sight to be like this, I want these superpowers, I want this, I want to eat like seven course meals every day, I don't want to have any digestive issue any time, I want to have no pain in my body ever, I don't want to do that, like whatever I can think of, whatever every single human being can and think of and we were all asking it and all the jinn kind were asking it and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to give everyone what they'll want then it would not then too it will not take from the treasures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as a needle takes from of water from the ocean when it's dipped into an ocean and taken out if a needle is dipped in the ocean and taken out how much water does it take from the ocean how much percentage of the water does it take from the ocean we can't even put in 0. 0.0000 anything, right? So if Allah Ta'ala will to give to everybody everything that they want and they have ever wanted and they will ever want, right? It will still not take from the treasures of Allah even that much. So we can't even imagine. So the fuzzle of Allah is another level. It's like it's uh, the treasures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are unlimited. But when we say unlimited, it is unlimited beyond my and your comprehension unlimited. Right? And then Lam yamsas humsu, then no evil touch them. No, um, you know, like uh, no, uh, yes, no sword had to be taken out, 
right? And um, yet this is recorded as the expedition of Hamraul Asad, right? And they got the reward of as if they had engaged in in a battlefield and everything, and they got the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu. They followed the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, right? Sometimes what happens is we have to strive and we have to do something like Uhud happened, but sometimes we just have intention and we show up like Hamraul Asad. Hamraul Asad, and Allah Ta'ala accepts that as well. The different times that different things happen in our life. Ibrahim alayhi salam was told to sacrifice his son Ismail. Allah Subhanahu didn't really take Ismail away from him. He had to make that intention and show up for it. And he got the reward of doing it, even though Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala didn't take the child from him. These people have left the home for sacrifice, fully ready to sacrifice themselves, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it depends on, uh, it is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whether he tests in a way that something actually happens or doesn't happen. But what we have to do is we have to protect our intentions and we have to show up and we have to do the best that we can, right? Uh, and that's what these people do. So their reward is because of their intentions and their efforts. And they said, labbaik to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what did they say, right? When uh, when the when the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came, what did they say? Samayana wa ata'ana. We heard and we obeyed. Similarly, what is what is there for us when we hear the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we know that Allah wants us to do something, what should we say? Samayana wa atana. I heard, Ya Allah, we hear and we obey. Don't worry or don't be scared while putting anything in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't keep from anybody. When we give something in charity, it will never reduce our um our wealth it'll never make us poor, right? Like any if, if we give something in charity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never uh, he'll reward us more than what we have given and and don't be scared if if you and me have to sacrifice something don't be scared don't um, or he he's rabbul alameen right for example for me and you if someone gives us a gift if somebody gave gave you a gift usually what happens is you we you intend to give uh, more than that back when you, when you have an occasion of giving them a gift right nobody likes to keep a gift from somebody Right, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is a shakur. He's the most appreciated, and that's like me and you, who's like who are little appreciative towards each other. He is the most appreciative of everything. If we sacrifice our sleep for him, he appreciates it. Right? If he he if we sacrifice our money for him, he appreciates it. If we sacrifice our time for him, he appreciates it. If we sacrifice our honor for him. Our respect for him. Somebody's making fun of us because we are doing hijab. Somebody's like teasing us because of like, uh, oh, you've become too religious now, right? Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like now you are the one who, who's like going to become religious, right? Like after so much that you've done in life, now you are going to turn religious. Like really, people would make these kind of like uh, comments. Or right? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala doesn't make these kind of comments. He doesn't say that like, oh, you're coming now. To do, the, he will never do that. Anything we put in the path of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, never be afraid to put in anything uh, in the path of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Right? Whatever you give of your time, if we give of our time, Allah Taala will put barakah in our time. If we give of our money, Allah Taala will put barakah in our money. And what does barakah mean? Barakah means that um, something had a hidden potential, but it had a potential, but it was hidden. But that potential comes out. Also, habaraka also means that something gives more. Then what was expected of it? Let's say I, I cooked for three people and somehow uh, and three people, three guests were uh, going to come. I cooked for three people, but somehow they ended up bringing two to more people and there were 10 people. And I was like, OK, I don't know what's going to happen, but the food that I had cooked for three people, it somehow was sufficient for all these 10 people and still more was left and everybody ate well as well. I don't know how that happened. That was Baraka. Baraka was in that food, right? So a little goes a long way. That's Baraka. Right? And there is blessings in it. There is goodness in it. Uh, some goodness comes out that was not even expected. That is baraka. And something that was had the benefits that were dormant that comes out that become manifest. That is baraka. Right. So Allah, whatever we give in the path of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, He is the possessor of bounty, which is great. So when we do things for His sake, right? Then um, uh, you know, then He appreciates in a way that none of us can. Right. And what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do with these people? By testing them, he increased their levels. The test was hard. The test was hard, but the levels that they were reaching was also very, very high. Right? So, um, you know, he knew, Allah knew that they are in no condition to fight. He did not decree fighting for them. Right? He does not give to anyone beyond their capacity. Sometimes the tests of our life come to raise our ranks and for us to be able to follow Allah's pleasure. 
to get to Allah's pleasure. These people sought the rida of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the raza of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did he do in turn? He returned them with so much blessings that they cannot even imagine. Right. But these blessings, the, the lesson for me and you, yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us a lot of lessons through these things in throughout the Quran. We will see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us different messages, different concepts through the uh, through sometimes through history, sometimes through natural um, phenomena around us, sometimes things in our own bodies, sometimes um, our own experiences, different things. But the message is for me and you. The message whenever we are studying the Quran, when we are reading the Quran, we, the best way is to take it personally that Allah Ta'ala is talking to me right now, right? So this is a message for me right now. So this message was not just for them. This message is for me and you as well. This message is for me that the father, the bounty, the blessings, the the barakah of the things that were there for them is also open for me and you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to understand that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to appreciate the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to be of those people that he is pleased with, that are that follow his pleasure, that are able, that, is, that seek his face, that keep our intentions for the sake of Allah alone and that he rewards and that he accepts with his and uh, may Allah Ta'ala protect us. Any goodness that comes from this talk today is from Allah alone because he's the owner of all goodness. Any mistakes, any shortcomings are for myself because I'm a human and open to mistakes. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala still accept from all of us coming together just like he united us as sisters in Islam. Um, today, may he reunite us as sisters in Islam on the day of judgment when there will be no shade except his under the shade of his throne, when there will be no shade except his. And then once again in Janatul Firdaus, uh, Subhanaka Allahumma, Ashadu Allah la ilaha illa anta, Nastaghfiruka, 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 Manatubu ilaik, Rabbana taqabbal minna, Inna ka anta samiyul alim, Ameen ya rahman rahimin.